My name's David, and uh, I'm presenting on uh, work done on, uh, on XLA by a whole team of people. Uh, you know, it, uh, they, they really are a, a fantastic bunch to work with. Uh, so it, it's just great to be able to represent them. So uh, this talk is about a compiler for linear algebra. Uh, and it is integrated into TensorFlow. But I feel like uh, it's a little bit necessary to explain uh, why we would have to go through all this effort to build a compiler in runtime uh, inside of Tem TensorFlow itself. Building a production quality compiler uh, is not you know, something you'd want to do out of hand, uh, out of boredom, or you know, uh, at the spur of the moment. It's something that you really need to have the dedication, motivation to want and need to do. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to give you guys a quick introduction to TensorFlow. So TensorFlow, uh, for those of you who might not know, is an open source library for numeric computation uh, w with a, a fundamental abstraction of data flow graphs. Uh, it's very popular for machine learning researchers. And the, uh, the nodes in these graphs represent mathematical operations like add, subtract, um, divide, et cetera, matrix multiplication. Uh, and these operations can be placed on CPUs and GPUs uh, where appropriate. The edges in this graph represents uh, values, um, which are potentially multi-dimensional arrays, also known as tensors, that flow between them. You know. And uh, tensors in TensorFlow have a shape, which is uh, the rank or dimensionality of the tensor, and a list of sizes which specify the extent of each of these dimensions. So uh, if we look at this little example graph, it should be pretty obvious to see what uh, I'm referring to here, right? We have uh, two input nodes, and an add node. Um, they all have a, sh a, a shape of a uh, single precision float array. Uh, they're all rank one, and uh, the bound of that dimension is 1,024 elements. And uh, the, the tensors uh, in input zero and input one flow into the add, and the add produces a result which flows to whatever further computation lays ahead of it and so on and so forth until uh, computation is finished. Um, you know. So uh, TensorFlow is very dynamic um, and this dynamism is actually very important. So uh, uh, it, TensorFlow is very popular among a, a research community of machine learners. Uh, they want to be able to express themselves in a very natural way. Um, so it, it makes sense to not force them to uh, hard code the shape of every single operation. It would be better if TensorFlow can kind of figure out what the shapes are. Uh, and uh, you know, while shapes, uh, sorry, well, rather, while operations may be data, data dependent in obvious ways, like uh, on their operands, you know, obviously add is dependent on its inputs, uh, the shape of a tensor might be data dependent. That one really uh, threw me for a loop. It, it means that uh, you might not know what uh, the shape of an op is until you evaluate some seemingly unrelated operation. So uh, this dynamism is uh, kind of frustrating for compiler engineers. Uh, if you have dynamic shapes, you don't really know exactly what code you need to run. So if you're interested in doing ahead of time compilation, well, you have to sort of take into account the possibility that, that you, know, you might be adding you know, scalars or you might be adding 10 dimensional tensors. Uh, you have to somehow take that into account, which means that you either have a runtime which um, uh, you know, handles this in some parametric way or you have uh, general implementations, but it, it's uh, decidedly uh, not a great situation. And it, it's also hard to efficiently reuse memory without knowing the shapes. So you can't really know how much memory uh, you might need until you start evaluating the graph. Because as you evaluate the graph, you find out you know, what the shapes actually are. Um, so if we look in, in this graph, um, you know, we, we can't tell if input 0 and input 1 are scalars or rank 10 or it, you know, if they're 
you know, something in between, if they're the same shape, um, there might be some implicit broadcasting going on to you know, have them uh, become equivalent so that we can add them. Uh, this, this isn't uh, optimal for uh, performance. It's not great for ahead of time compilation. And it, it's not the sort of representation that a compiler engineer really wants to see. So we needed to, to do something about that. Also, TensorFlow has a very, very large vocabulary of operations. So uh, what happens is that operations in TensorFlow get added for mo mainly two reasons. One is that you can't express your operation in terms of an existing set of operations. So composition is impossible because what you're doing is, is new. Um, the other reason is that composition might not be efficient. Uh, TensorFlow, uh, because of this dynamism, really evaluates sort of as like a uh, asynchronous multi-threaded interpreter, where it evaluates nodes um, as they become runnable. Uh, so what, what, what you end up with if you use a lot of composition is you just end up with more and more ops in this, in this graph, and that results, like if you're using a GPU, like tons of kernel launches, more memory allocations, worse performance. So uh, what a lot of people resort to is manually crafting uh, fused operations. And uh, when they do this, then they have to implement this operation like four times or three times, like for, for CPUs and for CUDA and for Sickle. It's, this doesn't scale well. Uh, from the compiler community, we learned this lesson, right? Like we don't implement Clang's code generation for each target that Clang targets, right? We don't have like the PowerPC IR gen for like, you know, for Clang. We have IR gen. It's, uh, it's nice, and you, 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 you know, we, we let LLVM take care of the lowering in Clang. Um, so XLA is uh, sort of um, what we see it to be the, uh, the answer to some of these problems. Uh, we're very excited about it. Um, we think it has a, a, t a ton of potential. Um, so XLA, is, uh, as mentioned, is uh, named for accelerated linear algebra. And uh, it is uh, both a compiler and a runtime that targets uh, CPUs, GPUs, and hardware accelerators. Uh, and inside of XLA, the fundamental unit of compilation is a module. Uh, and it is represented as a data flow graph. Uh, and the, the general flow um, is that you start out with your module that you've constructed by whatever means. You run optimizations like dead code elimination or common sub-expression uh, or what have you, and then uh, you co-generate it. And um, the idea is that really the mix of optimizations and what happens for co-generation is, is really up to, up to you. You can decide how you want XLA to, to run. If you want to run certain passes for your particular wacky machine, go for it. Uh, our goal is to just make it so that uh, the compiler engineer has the necessary flexibility to do whatever it is they need to do. Um, so what is a module? Well, a module contains operations, which we call instructions, and these operations are grouped into computations, which is basically a function. Um, you know, they may or may not have parameters, and uh, they, they designate one operation to be the sort of uh, exit or result node. Um, and one computation in the module is designated the entry computation. So this is like the int main, but instead of it being like an int, it's a multi-dimensional tensor. Actually, it might be a, a, a tuple, because you might want to have multiple results. So uh, the, our types in TensorFlow are all static um, and, uh, and knowable sort of uh, at, at uh, optimization and compile time. So we have some primitive types, like predicates and and 16-bit uh, uh, signed integers, 32-bit integers. We have all of the sort of classical types that you would expect to see. Uh, these are just a, a small uh, sampling of them. And we have composite types too, like you know, our arrays and uh, tuples. Um, and uh, we try to keep XLA to a, a rather small set of operations because we don't want backends to have to implement uh, a ton of stuff to be able to run a TensorFlow graph. Um, th these are just a, a, also a, a, just a small sampling. Uh, 
of the operations which XLA supports. Well, we have like element-wise operations, like add and map, and we have more complicated expressions like convolution and matrix multiplication, windowed reduces. Uh, we can reorganize data in lots of different ways. So we can, we can broadcast it, we can reshape it, we can slice and concatenate it, and of course we can form tuples. Uh, we support uh, control flow constructs like uh, while nodes, which allow you to run a computation until some other computation tells you to finish. Uh, we can call computations, and we can e even call uh, custom code. Maybe you have something that can't be reasonably expressed inside of XLA. It's so, like, so, so special that uh, it's beyond our ability to, to reason about. Um, if, if that is re really the case, we give you a way out. Um, and of course, we have parameters and constants. So we need a way to, to take TensorFlow to our, um, our, our nice uh, static representation. And uh, to do that, we have this, this bridging functionality. So TensorFlow, TensorFlow has uh, many ops. Uh, they all sort of need to be uh, implemented in terms of XLA in order for us to be able to, uh, to execute them. So for an example, here's the softmax op. Softmax is a relatively straightforward uh, operation. It just runs the exponential function over an input and then divides it by the, uh, the, the sum of everything in that in, of, of that exponential function of that input. And this is very naturally expressed in XLA. You know, basically, we run the exponential function and then an add reduction, and then we divide the exponential function with the reduction. Uh, if you would look, if if you looked at the uh, at the eigen uh, implementation inside of TensorFlow for you know how it how it does this normally, so to speak, uh, you'd find something similar. But you wouldn't be able to tease out the fact that these are uh, operations which we've composed. Um, so we we make it so that uh, you know a backend only needs to implement these handful of primitives and then they get softmax. They don't have to implement all of softmax, you know, and then implement something that looks almost just like softmax but slightly different. And, you know, you're just copying and pasting code and probably gonna, you know, make some small mistake and uh, heaven help you find it. Um, so uh, how do we actually get uh, from TensorFlow to XLA? Well, uh, traditionally, uh, uh, ops are implemented uh, for each device. We have uh, CPU ops and GPU ops and TPU ops. And uh, our, the way we uh, introduce the XLA abstraction to TensorFlow is by basically building another kind of device. Um, and uh, the idea is that you can just uh, you know, say, you know, I want this op to run through XLA, or you can let TensorFlow find uh, clusters of the graph which are compatible with XLA, and, and it'll automatically partition the graph for you, and, and uh, you know basically turn the, uh, the the TensorFlow representation into XLA. Um, while we've done a lot of work to implement a lot of ops, it's not complete, um, and uh, to handle that, you still have the existing TensorFlow core, and uh, you can just place whatever um, we have yet to implement uh, on, a, on on an existing TensorFlow device. Um, so now that we've made it from TensorFlow to XLA, we have to make it from XLA to actual code generation. And uh, for the CPU, this is actually very straightforward. Um, we have uh, this module uh, that we run what we call buffer assignment on. So we, we analyze all of the lifetimes of all of the operations inside the module and try to figure out what the uh, you know when when they come and and go, wh which we can sort of which buffers uh, can be assigned to uh, which operations, and this actually saves quite a bit of memory. We can play all sorts of tricks, like uh, assign a uh, uh, a buffer to the uh, output of an operation and to that operation's input. So it's sort of read modifying writing that buffer because it knows that it's like the last user of that, op of, of, of that buffer. Um, all, all sorts of really cool uh, uh, tricks and analyses that we can, we can sort of do because we have this whole program uh, analysis. And we take that buffer assignment in our module and we feed it into our IR emitter. 
This is a pretty straightforward uh, process where we basically turn an HLO computation into an LLVM IR function. And uh, the end result after we lower all of the operations in the, uh, in the computations is we get a module. And uh, LLVM is, you know, it's, it's got this great JIT functionality built in. We run uh, the org JIT and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have this thing that's just ready to go. We have, all, all you need to do to, to execute an XLA computation is to allocate some memory, um, find the entry point, and just call it, call, uh, call the entry point like it's a function pointer, and you're uh, off to the races. For GPUs, it's a little bit more involved, and that's because GPUs have these uh, things called kernels. Uh, we, we do the same sort of thing initially, like we, we do the buffer analysis just like on the CPU side, but to uh, correctly uh, handle this, uh, this kernel thing where, where uh, you know, you can't just uh, sort of chain up all your computation and feed it to the device all at once. Um, we figure out like, okay, we wanna run this chunk of code on the, uh, on the GPU. Then when it's done, we're going to run this chunk of code and we, we, we basically write down uh, how uh, we want to launch all the kernels. And uh, you know, executing them is pretty straightforward. We just execute them in a particular sequence. And uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it, it's pretty simple. There, there, uh, there are some uh, subtleties in, in the code generation. So in order to uh, correctly make the distinction between what is a, uh, a top level uh, operation and nested operation, we have to do something. Uh, and the reason why this is important is you want to be able to do something like use uh, NVIDIA's optimized matrix multiplication and convolution implementations if uh, your convolution is uh, unnested. But if your uh, convolution is nested inside of something, well, we can't launch a kernel for it. Uh, we're, al we're already launching our kernel. We can't launch a kernel inside of a kernel. So we have to do something else instead. So uh, the, the unnested operations map to uh, kernels and the nested operations just map to device functions, which uh, get called by the, uh, the, uh, the kernels. And because LLVM is great, uh, it, it just gets uh, inlined away. And uh, the, the fact that we have this, uh, these device functions, uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, a handy, uh, notation before LLVM just sort of vaporizes it all. Um, so so uh, one of the, uh, the great things about having a representation that we can analyze and optimize uh, is that you can, you can start to do some pretty um, uh, crazy things that uh, traditional compilers have trouble with. So uh, if you try to do like uh, loop fusion with a traditional compiler, you'll find that uh, oftentimes they can't figure it out. Even for really simple uh, loops, they'll be completely stuck and uh, not know how to do anything. But we don't have to do all the safety analysis and re reverse engineer the, uh, the, the, all the properties of all the code. We, we are the ones who are emitting the code. We are the ones who decided you know, that there will be a loop. Uh, so we can uh, just emit the fused code ourselves. We don't have to rely on the static compiler trying to, trying to do it. And we, we also can do uh, all sorts of uh, uh, very interesting uh, library fusion type things where we can see that, oh, uh, there's uh, you know, some really complicated looking operation. Well, that actually maps really well to you know, something inside of Kublas or QDNN, uh, some, some fancy NVIDIA library or some fancy Eigen abstraction or whatever. Um, so uh, to, to, to sort of uh, make the, the loop fusion example a little bit more concrete. Here's a graph which just does a multiply followed by an add. It's like an AX plus B type equation. And uh, the naive way of implementing this would be to have two kernels, a multiply and an add. And the problem with this is that we have to wait for the multiply kernel to finish before we can launch the add kernel. Uh, however, it's pretty obvious, right, that we don't actually need to wait for the entire multiply to finish before we can run the add. Uh, we can identify that in this case uh, we have two element-wise functions uh, feeding one feeding into the other, uh, 
uh, we can just uh, fuse them together. And the result is we get a single kernel, which does uh, the whole composed operation all at once. Now, uh, this, actually, this, uh, this approach generalizes pretty well. So we can uh, do it for all sorts of operations um, so long as they behave relatively well with regards to uh, how they manipulate their index space and the value space. So like a, a reshape, for example, reshape doesn't actually change any of the values in the input. All it does is change how you index into them. Uh, for example, we have a, uh, a broadcast feeding into an ad. Uh, we don't need to materialize the broadcast. We know what all the values in the broadcast are. We just need to, to make sure that uh, we know how to forward the value that we're broadcasting into the ad. So what, what this really is, is it's just function composition, right? We're just trying to compose uh, index manipulation and value manipulation. And whenever we can do both of these things, uh, we can do uh, fusion. And it turns out this happens a lot, right? With, with, the, with uh, loop fusion, we can greatly minimize the need to hand roll a composed operation, right? There are some ops that don't behave very nicely, though, like reduce. So reduce, uh, uh, it doesn't map, like the, the output of a reduce does not map cleanly into its input. Reduce collapses all of its inputs into a single value. Um, so this makes it a little bit tougher. Fortunately, reduce has this very interesting property where that uh, each, of the value, each of the inputs is only read once. So let's say we have a tiled implementation of reduction where each tile has like 16 elements in it, uh, we can uh, decide that instead of evaluating the input, we can just uh, materialize wh whatever fused expression we want. Um, you know, the, and, and that can be basically uh, you know, anything, right? That, uh, that allows us to kill off a huge class of, uh, of pre-canned, uh, sort of hand-rolled, optimized uh, um, operations. And uh, sort of the way we, we, we implement this in, in our compiler is uh, basically as uh, a, uh, a generator, which takes a uh, bunch of indices and uh, returns a value which would correspond to them. So all, all, all you need to do is uh, take in uh, an HLO and uh, a map from HLO to generator, and you can return a, a generator which would uh, correctly do the forwarding. So in this example, uh, for implementing fusion for negation, uh, negate doesn't do any kind of index transformation, so you just feed whatever index you, uh, you were asked for, and then you just negate whatever value uh, lies at, at, at that index. Uh, so so this, this approach, uh, uh, generalizes a lot. Uh, the benefits of, of being able to represent it this way means that it's very easy for us to add more kinds of fusion uh, and use fusion in a lot more places. And as I mentioned earlier, we can identify uh, places where um, NVIDIA or um, dollar hardware vendor uh, provides a pre-canned optimized routine. Um, in this case, uh, NVIDIA happens to give an implementation for uh, dot where one of the operands is transposed. So instead of having to materialize the transpose, we can emit the, the one kernel which does uh, both operations. So LVM uh, uh, has been really great for us, but there's some uh, small rooms for improvement. Um, we spent like 35% of our time uh, uh, allocating and deallocating memory for 65-bit APNs, and that's because um, Skev uh, likes to do a, like a bit width plus one type thing to figure out if your uh, operation will overflow. Uh, that's not like really ideal, but I think that this might actually be fixed as of like less than two weeks ago. I haven't measured recently, so I, I, I should take another look into that. And uh, our, our alias analysis uh, representation in IR is not so great. It used to be like n squared to update uh, uh, alias analysis information. I got that down to like 
n log n plus m log m, which isn't great. Uh, so uh, we really need to have some sort of set representation in the IR instead of representing uh, sets as essentially lists. Um, XLA has to limit the amount of information that it, it sends into LLVM in order for us to get reasonable compile times. So we're, we're very excited uh, about XLA. Um, we see uh, like pretty great server-side speedups. So the ability to do just-in-time compilation and specialize our kernels lets us uh, generate tighter, faster code, smaller code, use less memory. Uh, we see models and things that look like models uh, speed up by uh, up to 80%. In, in some cases, like in SyntaxNet, we get a latency reduction from 200 microseconds to five microseconds because of all that fusion. All of that, all of that fusion kills off 195 microseconds of kernel launches. We're also excited because of uh, mobile footprint, footprint reductions. So with ahead of time compilation, we know exactly what we need to bring in um, to turn a model into an executable. And uh, this allows us to slice out this huge TensorFlow runtime. And we can, we can cross compile to ARM, PowerPC, x86. Those are only the only ones I, I tested but I'm pretty sure it'll work with basically any LLVM backend that, that LLVM supports. Maybe not the 16-bit ones. Um, so uh, for example, one of our LSTM models for mobile went from uh, over 900 kilobytes to uh, under 100 kilobytes for a 9x reduction in size. So it makes it a lot more deployable of a solution. You know, maybe you can you know, deploy nine times more machine learning in your, uh, in your application. And uh, the other thing that we're really excited about is just how easy it is to do whole program analysis. Like we can do all, all of this fusion stuff and buffer analysis and, and uh, you know, other kinds of optimizations because we can see the whole graph. You know, we have this great high level optimizer uh, which can do algebraic transformations and, and fusion. Uh, we have this great nice uh, big set of reusable tools which we can apply uh, for multiple backends, it's uh, shared uh, quite nicely. It's, it's, it's nicely abstracted. And uh, we really leave it up to, uh, up to you, how you want to use XLA. If you want to use it uh, uh, w for like whatever wacky hardware that you want to support, or if you want to use it for CPUs and GPUs, you, know, you get to choose how you want to do your lowering. You, you, want, you can choose your optimization pipeline it's, it's really just up to you. So with that, um, I think I'd like to thank you all for To be, sh to be quite honest, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, I'm not uh, uh, the, the, the GPU specialist, um, but uh, even if you could launch a kernel from a kernel, it's still better to not launch more kernels, right? Like, there, there is latency in, in la launching a kernel, right? And second thing, uh, can you generate the GPU code for other backends, let's say, GPU? So, so that, that, that's a very interesting point. So uh, nothing inside of our GPU IR emitter is uh, specific really to uh, 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 NVIDIA's architecture. We don't like have warp size 32 and we'll hard code it anywhere. Or, you know, it's, it's, you, all you really need to do is uh, find the places where uh, we use Stream Executor, which is our abstraction for doing uh, uh, kernel launches and uh, replace it, or implement it rather, uh, for AMD's architecture. And that's, that would give you like an AMD implementation, uh, for example. So you, you'd have to change very little uh, of XLA itself to, to be able to uh, implement it for, AM, for, for another GPU uh, vendor. Um, so, uh, so for like 
for distributed uh, computation, we have, so just like TensorFlow has like send and receive nodes, uh, we have send and receive nodes in our representation. So it, it's basically a, a pass through type thing, right? Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so uh, it, it's definitely possible to use XLA as a as a library. Um, XLA right now has some uh, uh, dependencies uh, uh, in TensorFlow. But they're rather lightweight dependencies. They're things like, like it's it's string view implementation, um, n nothing like really sort of um, uh, unmanageable sort of to 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 break out. If like I, I expect that if enough people uh, came forward and were like, yeah, we really want to use XLA um, without TensorFlow as a library, uh, effort would probably. Uh, or could probably uh, happen to, you know, sort of make it more separate and more embeddable. But right now, uh, XLA is uh, kind of absorbed into TensorFlow. Cool. Uh, so you talked about two last comments on the CPU side. Are you mapping to the bar or the pair of uh, this? So, so on the CPU side, uh, we uh, we call it into Eigen for things like dot and convolution. Yeah. We we have a, a lot more plans for the CPU side. Uh, it's just um, you know the limited time, limited resources. You have to prioritize what you want, what uh, what gets done. So uh, I mean, all all this code is open source. It's all part of TensorFlow. Uh, we're very happy to accept contributions. Um, so you know, I, I encourage. Uh, those of you who uh, are like, oh no, don't use Eigen, use like, you know, some other math library. Please send patches. You know, there's uh, um, there are people who are who'd, who'd be interested in seeing them. Um, so yeah, it, it, it can't quite see what's going on because the, t the, the buffers are, are allocated in the runtime and passed in as, as an array. So it, it, it can't possibly know that that, that array is, is all distinct. Sure, but so you never have it. Because when you like yeah, we, every pointer here, it has a different name. It's uh, essentially, yeah. yeah. That, that's what we're basically trying to, to encode. And because we have so many operations, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we yes. So we, we even try to go out of our way to limit how much we, we, we need to say. So we like look around the graph and say like, well, okay, well, what could LLVM possibly benefit from by adding this to the alias set? And even with that, there's so much stuff that. <laughs> yes. Um, there is, I think, uh, some amount of cost analysis as to whether or not it makes sense to duplicate the computation. Uh, in the future, we can exp like we we have ideas on like making uh, fusion expressions return multiple outputs, so we can represent part. We can return like part of the like some some intermediate computation of the fused expression and the final fused expression, uh, so that we have like the best of both worlds. But we're not quite at the point where. We've made that a priority. <laughs> 
tenido eso? I mean, that's what our optimizer does, right? Is it automates the, the fusion. Okay. It, it detects the opportunities and. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you, you have some uh, operations and you know they can be fused. Yeah. This is specified by Oh, sure. The safety analysis, you mean, of whether or not something yeah. can be fused? Well, it, we also need to uh, describe uh, the implementation uh, of, of, of the index transformations, right? So, like, you kind of have to say, like, oh, and I've implemented it, uh, you know, be, you know I, you, it's not just a safety analysis. You also have to tell the truth and say that you've also implemented it as a, as, as a fusible expression. Um, but, uh, yes, in principle, uh, I imagine that it, it, it could be possible to like maybe only implement um, uh, things with like in, in terms of uh, like fusible expressions and sort of try to let the, the, the system figure out if it makes sense like oh well like this crazy huge thing probably doesn't make sense to, to fuse it would be like you know really awful so even though you've represented in a way that can be fused maybe it never would actually end up getting fused. Let's see if there are more questions.